Everything that you've seen up until now, as far as submitting expenses and getting them reimbursed, has been subject to certain policies which have been established in the background in a manner of speaking. Now we're going to take a look at that part of Expensify where we can establish certain criteria. For example, the minimum amount uh, over which a receipt is required and other things along those lines that create the rules around how expenses get submitted, when and to whom they need to be submitted, and all the criteria by which ultimately the expenses move through the process from getting submitted to ultimately being reimbursed and whether or not they should or should be excluded and why. Let's go ahead and see what this looks like. Setting policies in Expensify is essentially setting up the rules. What's allowed? What's not allowed? What are the limits? What are the minimums required? Who reports to who? Who submits to whom? And all those kinds of things that you want to be able to establish, especially if you have a larger organization with you know, more than, let's say, a few employees. But as you'll see in my example, using schoolofbookkeeping.com as the example here, even within a fairly small organization, it's still uh, important, if not useful, to be able to set these policies up so that the right workflow can be created. So let's take a look. It's easy to set a policy. And as you'll see in the written portion, uh, the policies are how the billing is uh, based. In other words, every policy that you set up means another monthly bill from Expensify. So theoretically and normally you might just have one policy for each company that you manage through Expensify, but you could have multiple policies if you wanted to. So if I go to admin, you'll see that I've set up a policy for the SOBs. And if I click on that, we can start getting in and having a look at what's here. Now, under the basics, you'll see it gives you just that, the basics, the policy name. Uh, the owner, as you can see, is myself, the uh, subscription type that we have. And then here's where we start to begin really setting some of the things. So max expense age days. In other words, nobody can submit an expense that's more than 90 days old. And the theory behind that would be to force them to probably come to you more specifically and explain why an exception should be made for an expense taking so long to get submitted for reimbursement, let's say. The maximum expense amount that can be submitted, pretty straightforward, most of this is. This is, I'm not going to allow an expense through for more than $2,000. In other words, again, that's something I'm going to want brought to my attention. The receipt required amount, the IRS these days uh, only requires receipts for anything over $75. The uh, reality is, in my own case, and I mentioned this in the write-up, is I'm leaving it blank because I want a receipt for everything. If somebody wants to get reimbursed for an expense, I want a receipt for it. I want it documented, what I reimburse them for, and uh, so that I know exactly how to categorize it and so on and so forth. So for me, it's required period dot the end no matter how little or how much the expense was. If you want to get reimbursed for it, submit a receipt. That's my sort of philosophy on that. Uh, the output currency, again, straightforward. Default new cash expenses is reimbursable, right? So if it's a cash expense, theoretically, in most cases, it's going to mean somebody's going to want to get reimbursed for it. Um, billable could be, could not be. It just depends. So I, I leave it off as the default. Uh, E-receipts enabled, I would say always do that. Why not? It doesn't cost you any extra. And a digital signature required is going to create extra friction. So only do that if you have a really good reason for wanting to require that. Uh, over here in connections, it's pretty straightforward again. You'll see that at this point, in some of the write-up, I had it connected to a desktop edition of QuickBooks. Now at this point, I've got it connected to uh, QuickBooks Online. And as you, you can see, you can sync now or you can configure uh, to change some of the settings that, that go along with uh, connecting to QuickBooks Online. And you'll see that in other videos in the course, how this all works. For now, just know that you can have connections to all these different products like Bill.com, FreshBooks, NetSuite, QuickBooks, of course, and Salesforce and Xero. Uh, and then here are supported connections. So these are other products that you can connect with Expensify and get Expensify to work with. So this is definitely handy to know. Obviously, you'll pick which one, uh, whichever product you're using that you need uh, working with Expensify. The categories are your chart of accounts. And as you just saw, I'm connected to my QuickBooks Online company. So here I am in QuickBooks Online. Here's my chart of accounts. And essentially, if you... Um, uh, add a new account, then you have to go back to your connections and make sure that you sync up. The new accounts will appear, I went over this again in another video, and then you have to check to make sure that it's enabled. So that's the accounts. Now tags, because I've, uh, oh, and one other thing on the categories, uh, 
you probably want to check this off in most cases where it says people must categorize expenses. This way, you first of all, the person submitting the expense kind of does the work for you that way, so you don't have to sit there on the receiving end categorizing this stuff. Let them categorize it. They're in the best position to know what they paid for, if it was for food or, or some other reimbursable type expense. So I would recommend checking this off in most cases. Uh, tags. Uh, as you'll see in other videos in this course, we talked about this. Uh, first of all, again, people must tag expenses. Now, the question is, what are tags being used for? In my case, because I have QuickBooks Online set up as the connection, if we go to configure, you'll see that my tags are using, um, I'm, I'm allowing people to categorize both customers and jobs and classes. So I'm using both. I've got that checked off here. And again, that gets reviewed in another video in terms of how to set that all up and what the differences really are. So when you get over here, I want to require that people must tag expenses because it means that I want them to tell me which uh, customer or job it's for at the very least and also uh, you know, assign it to a class. Uh, what I might do in a case like this is create a class for like unknown because that I might not necessarily expect my employees to know. So then we come over here to people and this is where I'm going to really spend most of the time where, where I feel pro probably uh, the most help will be required, so to speak, in terms of what this is all about. And even this is, first of all, you have three different types of, of uh, submission and approval processes. The first one is submit and close, very straightforward. You submit and it's done, right? Then submit and approve, meaning a person submits to a single person and that person has to approve it. Over here, what I've got selected is advanced approval, where you can set up an actual workflow. And that's what I've done. We've got three people in our organization who are using this. Myself, Eric, and Chris, who's our sales guy. So notice here in the column, in the second column, next to each email address, I can establish who each person submits to. So Chris submits to Eric, Eric submits to me, and of course I submit to myself. Then over here under details, uh, I have none for Chris. But over here, this is where you establish who approves to who. So submitting expenses is one thing. And what this is really saying is, you know, Chris submits to Eric. Then Eric, if he has his own expenses, will submit to me. But also when Eric approves Chris's expenses, he approves those to me. In other words, I get an, another sort of layer of approval. And I don't set this up in our case because I need to, to question what Eric's doing. If, question, if, if Eric approves something, I'm going to approve it myself, except in probably a very rare extreme case where I have a question. But the reality is the only reason I have it set up this way in our case is because I want that ultimate approval to go to me so I could submit it and get Chris paid and make sure that it's integrated properly with our accounting software. Frankly, so that Eric doesn't have to deal with that part of it. He can just say it's approved by me. And also, since Chris reports to Eric, it seems appropriate to set up the workflow that way. And if you click the settings wheel here, it's pretty straightforward. I simply put in uh, next to Eric that he approves to me by putting my email address over here. And there's some other options here. I can set up a second layer of approval. So he uh, approves to one person uh, for expenses up to a certain amount. Over that amount, he approves to somebody else. And then, of course, I have to establish that person's uh, user ID or payroll ID. So that's pretty much it. Or I can make Eric a policy admin. Uh, so that's the other option. And actually, as you can see, I've got that established here. He is, in fact, a policy admin. If I go over to Chris's, then he's restricted. And that's the story, folks. So that's how you set up the workflow in terms of submission and approvals. Uh, the thing you know to remember is that there's a separate column for who they submit to, and then who they approve to is here in the details under the settings or cog wheel. Uh, the rest is going to be pretty straightforward here. Distance and time, what's the rate per mile? Expensify will default you to the standard government reimbursement rate per mile. Uh, of course, you can have rate per kilometer in case you are dealing in countries that use kilometers and not miles. And of course, I have my default unit set here. You can enable time tracking and set a default hourly rate. Fantastic. As you can see, I've got that at zero. Uh, you can add custom fields to use. And we'll cover that perhaps in, a, in another course, you know, with, you know, with a more advanced sort of focus on things. The tax settings, um, you can uh, track uh, taxes on your expenses. I don't have that option set here. It's not applicable for me. But if you're, say, uh, an architect or like an interior designer, you know, client, I have interior designer clients where that becomes important because you're buying a lot of stuff on behalf of somebody else. So you want to track the taxes, make sure that you sort of get that credit against what you owe in the appropriate uh, taxing authorities. Uh, export formats. So you can set up new export formats 
the uh, reimbursement. So please set up a reimbursement account by going to settings reimbursement and adding the account there. Uh, invoices and then there's bill processing here which again in this course we're not going to go deep into that but I just wanted to at least give you a look at everything that's here with the major focus on the uh, the people part of it because this is where you're probably going to be most interested and curious about how to get this set up and that my friends is it that's my story and I'm sticking to it as always if you have questions and you're a registered student at schoolofbookkeeping.com please use the answers forum if you are not a registered student please register and or use some of the public forums that we have, such as Accountants, Bookkeepers, and Business Owners, which is our group on Facebook. I hope you're having an absolutely fantastic day, and I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson. Now that we know how to set policy, and for that matter, the whole process of submitting expenses, getting them reimbursed, managing and tracking all the information, I want to highlight that everything we've shown you so far in terms of the integration with accounting software has been based on integrating with QuickBooks Desktop. So... What we're going to show you for the rest of this course is integration with QuickBooks Online and some of the additional options you have there that aren't available in the integration with QuickBooks Desktop.